Good morning. If you could find your seats, we'll begin service. Hey, that was pretty quick. <laughs> Good job, RVF. Welcome to Rogue Valley Fellowship. Um, we're going to get started with an announcement this morning. Uh, today's going to be a great Sunday. We have our a guest teacher, Pete Santucci. Welcome him. You can clap. We can clap, church. <laughs> His wife, Charlene, as well, is here. Um, our first announcement for the day is our Delight Flight Evening. Um, this is on August 8th here at Ivy Street Chapel from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Um, this is a women's event. Here's some details from our women's council. It says, ladies, we invite you to explore various ways we find joy in the Lord in our daily lives. Our very own Stephanie Campbell is going to lead worship through song at the, at the beginning and end of the evening. And um, you'll be able to experience up to four different sessions. There'll be eight sessions, but you can choose four. Um, hosted by eight women who spoke at our most recent women's retreat. Event's going to be a great opportunity for those who couldn't come to the retreat. Yeah, I saw them there here. I'm excited. Um, <laughs> anyways, back to the announcement, Courtney. <laughs> Uh, anyways, it'd be a great opportunity. If you didn't get to go to our spring women's retreat, this is what happened at the retreat. Uh, feel free to bring a friend, share the news. Again, the details are in our app and on our calendar. Make sure to go there, save it to your personal calendar, and we'll get a graphic soon so that it'll be up here in future announcements. Again, Delight Flight Evening, August 8th, here at Ivy Street Chapel from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Speaking of delight and joy, we have a baby dedication this morning. And so if the Vorgang family would like to come up, you guys can clap. That's okay. <laughs> we have Matthew and Tessa and their growing brood. <laughs> um, and the newest here is Rosalie Ann. So cute. So cute. Um, if you guys would stand, if you're able and extend your hands. Let's dedicate precious Rosalie to the Lord this morning. I'm going to do this. Need some words. Father, we ask your blessing as we dedicate Rosalie to you this morning. May you bless and give grace and wisdom to her parents and siblings that they may love and raise Rosalie in the ways of our Lord Jesus and be steadfast examples of the faith. We, as a congregation, have a part in supporting them in this good work. So may we be those that rejoice with them in their joys and help them to carry their burdens in any trial. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing that is Rosalie Ann, and may she know how beloved she is by you, her family, and all of us here. We dedicate her to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It's now fellowship time. We've got about five minutes. Say hi to someone you don't know. Say hi to the Vorgang family. Bless you guys. <laughs>
Good morning, RVF. If you wouldn't mind finding your seats as we get ready to worship together. There are a few reasons why we do a call to worship. And I'm not going to tell you all of them, but I wanted to take a moment to read a quote from James K. Smith on the purpose of call to worship. He says, isn't this what Christian worship is meant to do week after week? To let the spirit of God, with whom nothing is impossible, convince us that this could be that despite a million voices crying otherwise, the gracious good news of the gospel is true. It is one thing to understand the sentence, the dead shall be raised. It is quite another to feel what it must be like if that is true, that he is risen. Worship gives us a moment to tune ourselves to God's presence and let our imaginations respond to his voice, that this story, that this gospel that we sing about and we practice is true. I'd also like to read Psalm 95 for you. Come, let us shout praises to God. Raise the roof for the rock who saved us. Let's march into his presence singing praises, lifting the rafters with hymns. And why? Because God is the best, high king over all the gods. In one hand, he holds deep caves and caverns, and the other hand grasps the high mountains. He made the ocean. He owns it. His hands sculpted the earth. So come, let us worship, bow before him, on your knees before God who made us. Oh yes, he's our God, and we're the people he pastures, the flock he feeds. Drop everything and listen. Listen as he speaks. Don't turn a deaf ear as in the bitter uprising, as on the day of the wilderness test. When your ancestors turned and put me to the test, For 40 years they watched me at work among them, as over and over they tried my patience, and I was provoked, oh, I was provoked. Can't they keep their minds on God for five minutes? Don't they simply refuse to walk down my road? Exasperated, I exploded. They'll never get where they're headed, never be able to sit down and rest. If you'd please stand and pray with me. Lord, through your spirit, restore our imagination and tune our ears to your voice and your story and possess all of our affections. And in your grace, bring us into your rest. Amen. The 
God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before him. As I stumble through the darkness, I will call your name by night, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. Declare. 
declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. God of wonders beyond galaxy you are holy holy the universe declares your majesty you are holy holy Lord of heaven and earth alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love in righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on thee. For I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. 
This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hands till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, only. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you. your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you.
me go ahead and take a seat for a minute. So before our scripture reading this morning, I just wanted to share, just give a little update on VBS, which happened this past week. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Um, first and foremost, if you volunteered this past week, whether it was for a day or for all five days, or actually six if you include setup, I just want to say thank you. We, yes, absolutely. We had a hundred kiddos come through the doors of Washington Elementary this past week. Um, and it was really an amazing week. Uh, I, it's probably my favorite BBS that we've experienced so far. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we got to collaborate with Ben Heidegger, who he and his wife Tara now head up Westside, and then Rousseau Brazer, um, who is now the quester. Um, and that was, that was really a phenomenal experience, and I think really the kids got to experience just the, the benefits of having the three of us come together and bring our giftings together. Most importantly, however, through the course of the week, I think what our kids got to experience is that God is big enough to handle their big questions. And um, they got to experience that God actually has some really incredible responses to some of their questions. And um, for the lesson time, Rousseau led that lesson time, but he co-led it with my dear friend, Judy Squire. And Judy was born without legs. And so they got to hear from her what it's like to um, bring really big, hard questions to God, such as, why would a good God make me this way? And what's really incredible about that experience, um, having Judy there, is that um, Judy led the very first VBS that I attended when I was five years old. And we realized this week, when I was five, Judy was 42 years old. And I'm 42 years old now, and we got to lead this VBS together, which is really amazing. Yeah. Um, so we, we came away from the week with maybe some scraped knees, but no major injuries. So I feel like that's a big success. And I really do think the kids had a really wonderful time. So um, again, most importantly, thank you to all of you who volunteered your time, whether it was for a day, because that's all you could fit in, but you chose to give your day away anyway, or those of you that sacrificed a whole week. If you see someone that volunteered for VBS this week and they look a little haggard, please give them grace, <laughs> including myself. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah. that. That picture is pretty cool, I think. With that, would you please stand for the reading of today's scripture, which comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. And because I'm 42, I'm going to put on glasses now. <laughs> that looks way better. <laughs> okay. Since therefore rest remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. This is the word of the Lord.
God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green, a quiet Even though I walk through the valley of death and dying, I will not fear, because you are with me, you're always with me, you shepherd. You guys can sit down. I'm not going to have you stand up for the whole time. It's great to be back uh, here with you. Um, it was only 14 months ago that uh, we connected with your pastoral staff at our place down in, in the Sun River area. Got to know them and got to really love your leadership team. Um, and it was, it was a, a gift to come last summer. I don't know how many of you were at the Psalm seminar that, that we did together. That was wonderful. Love the interaction. Um, love how um, hungry you guys are for the scriptures. So that was, was beautiful. Um, as we gather around the scripture this morning, I've got a pile of questions. Uh, I mean, th this world is such a mess. Anybody have a sense of that? <laughs> Especially this last week felt like it was a mess. So, what did God have in mind when he created it and us? And how do we live in this messy world without becoming part of the problem ourselves? And where is it all going? And if it's going somewhere, how do we help it get there? And then, of course, there's the question of, why is Kenner on this really long vacation? <laughs> and then there's the other question, what does Taylor Swift have to do with it? <laughs> now, the answer to all of those questions can be summed up in one word. All of those questions in one word. That were including the Taylor Swift question. And that word is Sabbath. 
what did God have in mind when he created this world and us? Sabbath. How do we live in this messy world without becoming a part of the problem? Sabbath keeping. Where is it all going and how do we get there? The great Sabbath to come is where it's going. Why is Kenner taking this really long vacation? Sabbatical. And then we'll get to Taylor Swift later on. Along with our Hebrews passage, um, I'd like for us to kind of have Psalm 92 in our imaginations. I'm not going to go verse by verse through either of those, but I want them to be kind of in our imaginations, kind of banging around inside of our brains as I talk this morning. So many of the Psalms have what's called a superscription. Just before it gets going, there's something that gives us a little bit of context about the Psalm. And And most of the ones that have those just say simply, of David. When we come to Psalm 92, it's the only one that mentions the Sabbath. Um, So it's, it's the Sabbath psalm. And I'm going to read from a different version of Psalm 92. So this is our psalm this morning. A Sabbath psalm to be sung expectantly. The most beautiful thing is giving thanks to Yahweh, singing of your beauty, greatest God, wondering each morning how we'll see your love through the coming day, remembering each night how we saw your faithfulness during the day gone by, taking it all in and composing songs on a happy guitar, on a passionate piano, on a soulful saxophone. You are such an amazing worker, Yahweh. I love the exquisite beauty of your workmanship. All your work is so creative, Yahweh. I'm in sheer wonder at the thoughtfulness behind it all. Your mind itself is beautiful. How stupid of people to miss out on this. How foolish to see the creation and miss out on the creator. The wicked seem to grow faster than grass. When they do their underhanded work, they always seem to succeed, but they're really killing themselves. You, Yahweh, are above us all and always will be. Look down and see your enemies, Yahweh. Look down and see them falling to ruin, their underhanded work falling to pieces. But you've made me strong as a stallion. You anointed me with richly scented oil. My eyes have seen the future failure failure of my haters. My ears have heard the drumming of their doom. But this future also is coming. The right living will grow like oasis-watered palm trees. They'll They'll grow tall and straight like Lebanon cedars. It's in Yahweh's own home they'll be planted. It's in his courtyard they'll grow green and strong. They'll be trees that bear fruit forever, full of vigor, full of life. Signs of how good and right is Yahweh's character. How solid, how unsullied by anything wrong at all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pause and pray. Here we are, Lord, just us, just us as individuals, just us as this gathered community. And Lord, we, we, we bring all kinds of things with us into worship now. We bring the heaviness of this last week with unexpected bills that we wonder how we're going to pay, with illnesses in family and friends that just weigh heavy on us as we we see mortality in those we love. When we see what's going on in the world and we say, Lord, are you doing anything in this? 
Some of us have worked really hard and are exhausted. And so we pray that in the midst of all of these weights and, um, and exhaustions, that you give us peace, that we encounter you and experience joy. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So with Hebrews 4, with its promise of a Sabbath rest, and Psalm 92, with its kind of hunkering down into Sabbath, we have to ask the question, what is Sabbath? Why is it important? And for a number of us who've read the New Testament, we need to answer the question, didn't the New Testament writers get rid of the Sabbath? Because there, there are a number of passages that make it seem like we've gotten rid of the Sabbath, uh, including Colossians 2. So let me deal with that last part first. No, the New Testament does, does not get rid of Sabbath or Sabbath keeping. What it gets rid of is a bunch of things that were added onto and um, all these rules and regulations that, that um, got piled onto Sabbath keeping. Jesus, when he called himself Lord of the Sabbath, wasn't killing the Sabbath. You don't call yourself the Lord of something when you're getting rid of it. You call yourself the Lord of something when you're taking back something that was stolen. And I don't know if you've noticed, um, when, we, when we celebrate Easter every year, it was really important to the Jews to make sure that Jesus was off the cross before Sabbath and Passover began. But then his disciples didn't do anything on Saturday. It's only on Sunday when the Sabbath is over that the women come to the tomb to take care of his body. They kept the Sabbath. Jesus kept the Sabbath, and they kept it as well. Even though he was accused of breaking it, he never did. So when it comes to the rest of the New Testament writers, and particularly Paul, they didn't get rid of the Sabbath either. What they did was they got rid of it as a sign of being a part of the people of God, about, of being a part of the Jewish people. Um, a significant number of Jews were spread out in the Roman Empire. And when, when you're a minority group of people in the midst of of another group of people, you, um, you often establish for yourself boundary markers. I mean, what is it that sets us apart from everybody else? Um, most groups do this. We do this as Christians. Uh, other groups do this. For them, there were three boundary markers that established them as different from everybody else. The first was circumcision. The second was a kosher diet. But the third was a religious calendar. So it included the, the Jewish feasts and festivals like Passover and Pentecost, but it also included this weekly Sabbath. So Paul and the others are trying to get rid of this, these boundary markers because the only boundary marker that the early church had was baptism into Christ. This is what establishes us. Um, and so they wanted to get rid of this. And so, so Paul, and especially in, in Colossians 2, goes through each of those three things and says, uh-uh, baptism. We are baptized into Christ. That's the most important thing. So you don't have to become an ethnic Jew. And that, this was really important for the early church because very quickly, the number of non-Jews exceeded the number of Jews. And among those Gentile Christians, so many of them were slaves. Um, and so they, since they weren't Jews, they couldn't get the Sabbath off. They had to work on Sabbath. So how did, how did they do this? So early Christians very quickly moved from 
Saturday to Sunday. And um, they called Sunday the Lord's Day because that was the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. That was the day that, that kind of launched this new creation. Um, so they, they kept Sabbath, but they moved it from Saturday to Sunday. All right. So Sabbath keeping was important for them, and it still has an importance for us. We just need to know why, why they struggled with it back then so we don't, just, we don't fall into the same problems ourselves. All right. Creation. Genesis 1, in this creation story, everything else, everything in this, this creation story points toward the seventh day. All these six days point, point toward the seventh day, which is, makes it frustrating that whoever divided the Bible into chapters that wasn't, wasn't originally divided into chapters, but whoever did that, I think made a mistake of putting the chapter break between the sixth and the seventh day. Because all of these first six days, they all lead up to the seventh day. They all point toward it. Um, all these repetitions that are all seven times in the first six days all point toward the seventh day. And each of these days is considered good, but when we get to the seventh day, it's the first thing in the Bible that's referred to as blessed. Not a person not a place, a day. It's blessed. On it, we're told God rested from all the work that he'd been doing. Now that begs the question, right? Did God need to rest? Because if I read Genesis 1 correctly, God doesn't even lift a finger when he creates. He creates by command, right? He speaks and it happens. So if God didn't need a rest then, and he obviously doesn't need a rest now. Why did he rest? God's rest is invitational. God rests so that we will join him in his rest. So my, my family loves to go for hikes. Uh, we, we are a hiking family. Um, we didn't have very much money for a long time, and so hiking was kind of our our jam because it's free. So we, ever since our kids were little, we, uh, we kind of established this thing that you can hike as many miles as your age. So um, once our hit, kids hit a certain age, um, we, we established that once, if we did a hike that was five miles long or more, we would go out to ice cream afterwards. We kind of had to bribe them. And it, it also gave us a little bit of a celebration at the end of our hike, right? So um, after a good long hike, we could stop and rest and celebrate at the end. But it wasn't just at the very end that we needed a rest, right? We needed rests all the way along. Now, our kids are all grown up. Our youngest is 19. And they're all much stronger and faster than we are. The tables have been turned. And often in our hikes, they'll get way out ahead of us. Now, the frustrating thing for us is that eventually they'll wait for us. They'll stop and wait for us. But as soon as Charlene and I catch up with them, they want to go on again. So they get a rest, and we don't. God's rest is invitational. God rests so that we will stop our hike and rest too. We'll catch our breath, we'll talk, we'll look around at the scenery, and only after we've rested will we continue on. So our weekly Sabbath is a pause along the trail. It's necessary, it's good, it's beautiful, it's relational. But these weekly Sabbaths also point to the end. They point to the great Sabbath to come, to the, the ice cream around the table at the end of the hike. 
So weekly Sabbaths are a down payment on this great Sabbath to come, which we generally refer to as heaven. And these Sabbaths along the way, as I've said, are invitational. God rests, so we rest. If we look at the Ten Commandments, um, there's two different versions. There's the one in Exodus and the one in Deuteronomy. And if you put them side by side, they're almost exactly word for word, except for the fourth commandment, the Sabbath command, which is vastly different between the Exodus and Deuteronomy versions. In the Exodus version, it looks back to creation and says, we know who we are, not by looking in the mirror, not by looking deep inside of ourselves. We know who we are by looking at God and doing what he does. So the Exodus command says, looks back and says, God rested when he created, therefore we rest. So there, it's, it emphasizes the yes. The Deuteronomy command emphasizes the no. So the Deuteronomy command, instead of looking back to creation, it looks back to the Exodus. It looks back to slavery in Egypt and says, we were slaves in Egypt and we are never, ever, ever getting back together with that. We are not going to be slaves again and neither are we going to enslave anybody else. Everybody gets a rest. Even those who work for us, and even the animals that work for us, everybody gets a rest. So elsewhere in the Torah, the five books of Moses, this gets expanded to not only include humans and animals, but the rest of creation as well. So the land gets its rest. It gets a sabbatical every seventh year off. It's fascinating. If you ever take the time to look at the very end of Second Chronicles, the very end there, it, it says that, that the people of God go into exile so, because the land has not received its Sabbath rests and it's catching up, um, which makes me wonder about our own agricultural practice sometimes. So, we've got these two versions of the Sabbath command. One emphasizes the yes, we do what God does. One emphasizes the no, we will never, ever, ever be slaves again. So, I'd like to, to dwell on the, the no and the yes. And I'll start with the no because I like to end with yes. So... The no, as we've seen, is a no primarily to slavery. We're not going to do that again. Not going there. So there's something about the way that we go about keeping Sabbath, which is a big no. Um, it, in the not doing, is, an, is a no saying action. So first of all, it's an act of defiance. This no, this stop of Sabbath keeping is an act of defiance. Sabbath keeping says a defiant no to our culture, to the priorities of our culture. I mean, we, we live in this culture of consumerism. Historically, uh, when our country used to keep Sabbath, there was no buying or selling ever done on Sundays. Some of you are nodding. You remember that. Um, and those blue laws started going away in the 60s, and they pretty much were all gone uh, in the 70s. Um, those were important. Um, before then, you know, things, things shut down. You, you just, you, we as a culture said no to buying and selling. And that this protected employees. It, it protected them from them having to work on Sabbath, gave, made sure that everybody had a Sabbath. But it also protected us as consumers because there was a day when we couldn't buy stuff. There was no Amazon or anything else either. 
But our culture treats us as consumers. It reduces us to our credit cards, to us as people who buy stuff. That is our purpose in, in life, according to our culture. You are your wallet. What would it be like if we refused to buy or sell on Sundays? What if this was the one day where we never used our credit cards? It would be awkward and, and difficult. We'd have to do some planning and preparing in order to do it, but it wouldn't be that difficult. Sabbath keeping, secondly, is also an act of equality. Sabbath keeping refuses to treat the CEO and the janitor any differently from one another. Six days out of the week, they're different. One has the corner office and one mops the floors. But on Sunday, on Sabbath, neither of them is a CEO or a janitor. They're just people. Their core humanity is restored to them. And they can greet each other just as humans, equal. Not only do we refuse to do our jobs on Sabbath, we refuse to think about our jobs as well. The ancient Jewish practice here is that if I even think about doing work on Sabbath, that is itself work. And therefore, I won't do the thing I thought of on Sabbath when Sabbath is over. So we don't make plans or lists on this day. We make them before so that we can not think about, we, we can't be oppressed by our work. This can be especially difficult for students, um, but it's possible. Uh, when Charlene and I were in graduate school is when we started keeping Sabbath ourselves. We hadn't really even thought about doing that beforehand. I mean, it, it was a thing that was out there, but, you know, we'd kind of been taught that the New Testament got rid of it. But then we, we started to try to do this ourselves. So we're, we're in graduate school together, and there's all these papers to write and exams to, to study for. And, um, but we said, no, um, we're, we're not going to do that. And it was amazing. We were able to, to go all the way through. I, um, I was able to, to earn two master's degrees and never get burnt out just because we said no. We did all our work before and after and kept this day to pray and to play. Third, this is an act of justice. Sabbath keeping protects people from being overused and it keeps the environment, the world around us, from being overused. It's this reset button on how we think about other people and stuff. They cease to be functions, and they're restored to who and what they were in and of themselves. So a tree stops being a source of wood for a fire or for building something, and a, a guy who is a police officer during the week ceases to be a police officer who writes you a ticket if you go too fast and is simply someone to be in relationship with. Restoring humanity to people who have been re reduced to their functions. And we do that all the time, right? We reduce people to functions. We don't even notice that we're doing it. So the checker at the store is reduced to the function of being a checker. That, that person that you call on the phone when, um, when you want to check on the warranty uh, for your product that broke is a function. And Sabbath re restores people to their core humanity. All right, so some yeses. Sabbath keeping is a yes to worship. On Sabbath, we pray and we play. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll say a bit more about worship later on. Uh, Sabbath is also an act of hope. Each time we pause and, and observe the Sabbath, it reminds us that there is a great Sabbath to come. 
And it's, it's really easy to forget the future that the New Testament promises to us because we get so caught up in the stuff that's going on in the world and in our lives and, and the chaos of it and the needs and requirements of it. And the Sabbath reminds us there's something else out there that this is all leading toward. So our, our psalm, Psalm 92, looks forward to this great Sabbath to come. Um, and it's, it's really the key to, to understanding that psalm. The psalm begins with uh, this call to worship God, which is a very Sabbathy thing to do because it restores God to the center of our lives. But then the psalm starts getting sad and frustrated because people do all kinds of bad things and they seem to get away with it. Evil abounds. And that is just about as opposite to the Sabbath rest as we can get. If there's anything that steals my rest, my peace, my joy, it's the touch of evil on my life. Or even just the presence of evil in the world. It just, it sucks that out of my life. So dwelling on the presence of evil in the world seems to be about the least Sabbathy thing that we can do. And yet here it is, right in the middle of the one and only Sabbath psalm in our Bible. So what gives? Well, honesty is what gives. If we're going to enjoy Sabbath, we need to be honest about the enemies of the shalom, the peace, the wholeness, the goodness, the put-back-togetherness that God is doing in the world. If we're not honest about the evil in the world, we're going to be surprised by it. We're going to be ambushed by it, and we're going to end up being angry with God about it. But the psalmist isn't just honest about the evil currently in the world. The psalmist is honest about the future. And that future is one where evil is finally and fully dealt with. And the righteous will live like oasis-watered palm trees, living in the courts of God's palace. Always green, always healthy, always, always. Every Sabbath that we keep is a reminder of this great Sabbath to come. It's, they're kind of like a down payment on this great Sabbath to come. Each one reminds us of its beauty that will be forever by insisting on a taste of that beauty right here and right now, which leads us to our next thing, that Sabbath-keeping is an act of beauty. Sabbath-keeping says yes to beauty in the world by enjoying a little bit of it every single week. So a poor Jewish household would enjoy poor food six days a week, a week so that they can eat a little feast on Sabbath. They'll eat on chip dishes six days a week, but on china and with sil silver candlesticks on the table on the Sabbath. They'll fast so they can feast every week. But our tendency in our culture is to sip Diet Coke all seven days a week and never really celebrate on the seventh day. We'll get our daily fixes of sweetness and then there really isn't all that much to celebrate on, at the end of the week. But if we don't know how to fast, we don't know really how to feast either. And if we don't take time each week to celebrate, to feast on this Sabbath, then I don't know that we'll trust God enough to fast. So wouldn't it be great to just set aside the sweets and the treats for six days and just to do it up right one day a week? Next, it's an act of celebration. Sabbath reminds us that we were created for joy. 
It dignifies our play. It is a day to enjoy creation, recreation, and procreation. And yes, I did say that. At the center of the universe is God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is shared life and shared love within this relationship. Hard to, to wrap our minds around in some regard that this, three, this unity of who is God is also three. But within this relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is joy. I think that's the single word that best describes what's at the center of the universe is joy. Joy shared in the shared life together. Sabbath connects us to the joy that exists inside of God himself as we connect with God to, in worship and with one another also in worship. Sabbath keeping is the triumph of time over space. Now that may seem kind of strange to say, but let me unpack that. Jewish scholar Abraham Joshua Heschel referred to Sabbath as a cathedral in time. Not a cathedral in space, but a cathedral in time. Where we go, go to church, and you all came to church this morning, Sabbath comes to us wherever we are. So Sunday comes to you wherever you are. During the Holocaust, Nazis could take away every possession owned by Jews and imprison them in concentration camps. They controlled the physical world, but they couldn't control time. They couldn't keep the Sabbath from coming to their Jewish prisoners week after week. And so for religious Jews, it didn't matter that they couldn't go to synagogue because Sabbath came to, to them and restored the dignity to them that the Nazis were intent on stripping from them. Does that make sense? Nazis couldn't do a single thing to keep Sabbath from coming, and it, it came week after week and restored them, kept them going through their time. Our culture chooses stuff of space over time. For us, time is money. Sabbath reminds us that money is not time. You cannot buy a single second. Time is the only thing any of us ever has. All the things of space, our stuff and even our bodies, are going to be stripped from us eventually. Not time. As a down payment on the great Sabbath to come, weekly Sabbath keeping connects us to this limitless future of eternity that's ahead of us. Okay, to Kenner. Why is Kenner gone for so long? Friends, he's not on a long vacation. Kenner is on a sabbatical. And that's not just semantics. That's not just playing with words. His goal isn't to get paid for taking time to do nothing. His goal is to get Sabbath back into his bones, back into his soul. It's so easy for us to get caught up in all the striving, especially in our achievement-oriented American culture. We go and we go and we go and we do and we do and we do. And going and doing is important. We have stuff to do and we've got places to go. But it can swallow up who we are. And if you have a sense of that, of just all of the going and all of the doing swallowing you up from time to time, we need Sabbath as this hard stop this reset every now and then. And Kenner needs this because if he doesn't have Sabbath in his soul, he's not going to lead you into it either. But if he soaks 
in Sabbath right now, he will be able to come back and help you soak in yours. And I, I've hung out with lots of pastors over the years. And pastors, unfortunately, are not always the healthiest people. Far too many don't even take a Sabbath each week. There's an irony here because they often feel pressure from their congregations to not take a Sabbath. And so what do, do they do right back to their congregations? They work them too hard. But listen to Psalm 127. Unless it's Yahweh building the house, the work is pointless. Unless it's Yahweh protecting the city, the security guards might as well go home. What's the point of getting up early or staying up late, working hard for the wage of working hard the next day? You need to know this about God. He loves giving rest to the ones he loves. Do we believe this? Do we really believe that God loves giving rest to the ones he loves? Then why don't we do it? Why don't we receive this rest? Why don't we take the time to just rest and enjoy and celebrate? The reason is because work is the most godlike thing we do on a regular basis. As Psalm 92 said, God is a worker and always has been. We are his workmanship, as is all of creation. God makes and builds and speaks and orders and teaches and heals and gives counsel. And each of those words describe the jobs that a lot of us do. But really, our work is a copying of God as the worker. And as I said, work is the most godlike thing we do on a regular basis. And as such, it can be addicting to us. Shaping and controlling the world around us is heady stuff. Refusing to stop working is a refusal to stop shaping and controlling the world around me. It is a refusal to stop playing God. Remember what the serpent promised when urging Eve and Adam to eat the forbidden fruit? He said that they would be like God. That's the original temptation. They could be the gods of their own lives. A refusal to stop working is a tasting of that fruit. Okay, I'm going to be super annoying and invasive right now. You ready? Needing to have our phones all the time is 100% eating the fruit of wanting to be the gods of our own lives. There was a time when the only one who was accessible all the time was God. We call that access to God prayer. But now we all need to be accessible all the time. We need people to be able to get a hold of us to pray to us. Maybe that's overstating it, maybe not, but consider it. And if I need to always know where my kids are, doesn't that sound like something only God should be able to do? And if I need to be able to answer any questions using Google or whatever and have an immediate answer, doesn't that also sound like something only God should be able to do? All that to say, Sabbath is a day when we stop trying to be God. I mean, it's such a burden trying to be God. So this is a day when we can stop trying to be God. I know there's some among you who are phone-free for 24 hours each week. Honestly, it's not something I do. But maybe we should do this together. Um, so I preach to myself. Uh, and Charlene and I are, are having conversations about what Sabbath-keeping 
will look like for us now. We've we've gone th we've had these conversations over the years um, since we've been married over these thirty years, uh, and sometimes we do it well, and sometimes we don't do it so well. So it's just it's a good conversation to come back to. And so I need this as much as anybody else. Okay, as we finish, there's been this image up on the screen the whole time. It's, uh, I think Kenner has talked about this a few times. It's an icon um, called, often referred to as the icon of icons, uh, painted by um, a, a guy named Rublev. It's the Trinity in the Old Testament, um, and it, it draws from the story when Abraham um, entertained these three angels that, that came to visit him. They're the ones that, that um, promised that uh, they would have a child, or that within a year um, the child would be born, and Sarah laughed. But anyway, this, this image um, Rublev used to introduce us to an imagination of for what the Trinity is like. And so if you notice that the, the three persons are inclining their heads toward each other, there's this kind of mutual uh, respect and mutual submission, re mutual acknowledgement, mutual love that they, that they have for one another. And they're gathered around a table. They're, they're sitting down, they're reclined, they're not working. They're enjoying a Sabbath. And they're enjoying a meal together. Um, in the middle of the table is communion. There's worship at the center of this relationship. And the table is a triangular table, but it's cut off. The point of the, 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 tri the triangle is cut off so that you and I can also sit at the table. It's an invitational table. It draws us in. There's something funny about the perspective that pulls us into it. The rest, the joy, the relationship at the center of the universe between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is invitational. And Sabbath is our our best way to enter in. There's lots of ways to enter in, but this is, this is where we get to sit and soak and enjoy in this relationship. But it's not just me as an individual. It's us as a people. We are all invited in. And what's, what's amazing about this invitation is the love that the Father has for Jesus is the same love that the Father has for you and for us. The same love that Jesus has for the Spirit is the same love that he has for you. Do you believe that? We are invited into this relationship. So, Taylor Swift. Um, on Disney Plus, it has the Eras tour. Any of you have seen that? No? It's okay. Um, there's a couple honest people. <laughs> it was really interesting to watch um, because you, you have this huge crowd of people that this was like the singular event of their life. Like, they had been looking forward to this. You, you can tell by watching the, the audience. And the audience, to me, was the most fascinating part of watching it. And they all sang every single word of every single song. And they knew this. They, they had spent good money. And they'd been looking forward to this for a long time. They, they wanted to be in the same room with this person. And they also wanted to be in the same room together with this same person. 
this may, may sound semi-heretical, but it felt like heaven. It felt like the great Sabbath to come. I mean, just the, the joy that was on faces as they were together. There was connection made. And it, it was obvious to me that she had rehearsed all these, these beautiful things that she was saying to the crowd, but boy, they, they, they just ate it up. Um, they were together. Sabbath keeping on a weekly basis is a joyful celebration of this life that God has called us into. It is a foretaste of what is to come. We will get there. And it is so easy for us to get caught up in the pain and the loss and the struggle and the chaos. And we, when, we, when, we, when we keep Sabbath, we, we don't... We're creating a little window in time. It's, just, it's not for the... It, we, we can't keep the chaos back all week long, but we create this little space, this bubble, this joyful bubble, where we go, ah, yes, this is, this is where this is all going to. This is where it's all headed. And then we, we get back into the work and to, and to the slogging through of things, but then we, because we can make it through because we know Sabbath is going to be waiting for us. It's going to come to us again the next week, and we'll get back into this. And we'll be reminded again where we're going, where this is all headed to. And we, we won't, we won't be, the, be part of the problem. We won't be angry. I mean, we, we'll get frustrated, but we'll know there, there, this is going somewhere, and we will have a taste of it every week until we get there. Pray with me. Lord, we, we are glad to work for you. We are glad to do the jobs that we do. But we are also really glad to rest. Thank you um, for dignifying us with good work. But thank you also for dignifying us with good rest. Lord, I pray that we will be people who works hard, but people that rest and enjoy and celebrate and return to our relationships with one another and with you joyfully. Amen. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great.
Amen. Amen. Pete, Charlene, thank you guys so much for coming down and sharing with us today. It was a blessing. Um, and I know a lot of you guys are itching to get home to practice Sabbath. Um, before that, we have some work for you to do. Um, Courtney has a van full of VBS stuff that needs to get brought into the building. So if you can be good Christians and help with that, <laughs> we would appreciate that. No guilt trip. Maybe a little, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, we would appreciate that help if you could do that. Um, to end this sermon, this is a poem by Malcolm Geit on Sabbath. Uh, he's my favorite poet, priest, and funny looking guy. Um, but yeah, just take a moment to listen. Uh, let it bless you this morning. Sabbath. Blessing and rest. Delight in everything. Sustained by your strong love and richly blessed. This is the gift you give, the day you bring, blessing and rest. This is indeed the gladness of the best. From first lines in the east where linnets sing to where the last light lingers in the west. You lift the cares to which I used to cling as you yourself descend to be my guest and show me how to find in everything blessing and rest. Beloved of Christ, as you go, may the God of rest fill you with his peace and presence as you rest in him. Go in blessing and rest. Go in peace. <laughs>